whether it's the vaccine passports, whether it's digital identity, whether it's central bank digital currencies, these are things that are kind of being organized around us and above us. Mm -hmm. uh, they are not, there, there's no national debate. And uh, this, sh this should be happening. There should be conversations taking place in every parliament, but there should be conversations taking place around the dinner tables uh, of every household. I mean, like this is this is about the way our world will be in the future. It's about the way mm. our children's world will be in the future. Nick Corbisley is the author of the book Scanned. And in this podcast, we go into an investigation about what vaccine passports could mean and what doorway they're opening up to potentially greater levels of control, also being tied into central bank digital currency, which could all sound cool, but it could also be a very dark future. We also go into what the parallel structure might look like, and it really feels like we're at a choice point here, and this information is really valuable. So I hope you guys enjoy this podcast with Nick Corbishley. The truth is, is that we're all the master, we're all the healer, we're all the mystic. Give it up one time for Aubrey Marcus. Nick, good to have you on the show. Thanks for having me, Aubrey. It's a pleasure to be on. Ideally, it would be under better circumstances, and potentially, maybe we would never even be talking. You would be living a lovely life in Barcelona, I would be living my life here in Austin, and we would have nothing to talk about. But here we are, and there's something very important to talk about. Because at the start of the pandemic, there were certain people who were worried about a scenario in which vaccine passports would be created, and then many different things would be layered on top of these vaccine passports, and then they would become digital IDs. And this would be a part of a process that leads to a real dystopia, a real dystopia, a dystopia that we've seen happen in places like China, uh, where your social credit score is linked. And now we're starting to see initial steps that are dangerously familiar to that narrative. And this is what your book Scanned is all about, is about how the steps that we're starting to see can lead to a real dystopian future. So let's let's start to, you know, go back to the beginning where probably you and I know many other people kind of had an idea like, uh oh, you know, this this is not what it seems. This can lead, even if the intentions are good, let's just assume that potentially they are, the intentions are good, it can lead to something that's very, very dangerous. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the, the pandemic opened opportunities, they opened up um, possibilities to use technologies that were already ready for use. And we have seen um, some, uh, some very good examples in, it in Italy and France, Germany, across, across the European Union where vaccine passports have been rolled out, they've been put into force in ways that nobody really anticipated when the vaccine passports themselves were launched. Um, we did not think, for example, that in Italy at this stage, if you were unvaccinated, you would, and over the age of 50, you would not be able to work. You would not be able to earn a living. You would be essentially sidelined, banished, to the fringes of society for not having taken uh, a vaccine that is not um, showing any potential of um, stopping the spread of this virus. And we are in a weird little moment where people are being told that everything is returning to some semblance of normality. And we are going back to a certain, the life we lived before Whereas I would argue that we are doing the exact opposite. We're going to a world which is, which is markedly different from the world we lived in before. And it's a world where these technologies that are only just being um, rolled out at a kind of like, you know, we're just beginning to see the glim a glimpse of what 
these technologies can achieve, what, what, they, what, what kind of effect they could have. And we are about to see, I think, a very, as you said, a, a very dark dystopian future if we don't begin to take actions to try to stop it. So the argument about vaccine efficacy, it's a whole other argument. You know, and it's almost it's almost tangential to this to this primary argument because, really, even if the vaccines were effective, the utilization of a vaccine passport and a vaccine apartheid, you know, unless you created the most intense situation where you could possibly imagine this is the very last option that there was possibly on the table, and. I suppose you could create some hypothetical scenario. It's clear that we're not in that hypothetical scenario where we would be willing to make all of the sacrifices of freedom and create this vaccine apartheid, create the separation and segregation of classes of people based on medical decisions, which were always supposed to be, through the Nuremberg Code and a variety of things, a personal choice, you know, ultimately. And we've really collapsed that in many different places and this idea of, oh, it'll just be convenient. You'll have this thing that'll show whether you're vaccinated or not. This is just the seed of a potential road. This is like laying the initial tracks for a potential road. And, and I'm not as familiar as you with how that's being deployed in different countries. But to hear that that's already the case in Italy, I mean, this is this is starting to get into that kind of scary territory where you're really being absolutely forced to do something whether you want to or not, right? Like there's no, there's no sovereignty of choice anymore. No, and it's, um, it's, it's a truly terrifying reality when you think about it. Um, I think that if we were to go down that hypothetical, if we, if we were to talk about the hypothetical, then you would be talking about maybe something like smallpox, um, as I mentioned in my book, which had, um, going back 150, 200 years, had a mortality rate of around about 30, 40%. And you had a vaccine that was exceptionally effective and well understood um, and very safe. We don't have that right now. So we have... Um, uh... And so, and you would also have to suppose, like the reason to create, like everybody took, the, everybody wanted to take the smallpox vaccine because it made sense. It intuitively made exactly. sense. It worked. It prevented you from getting smallpox and you had a really good chance of dying, whether yes. you were healthy or not. The cost benefit uh, ratio was very different. Very different. And and you would have to have to, to impose mandates and passports like we were talking, you would have to have a group of people that just were completely unwilling and were actually a hazard or a danger. However, at the same time, because of how effective the smallpox vaccine was, there's also an argument to say like, well, if everybody who's afraid of getting smallpox, they're going to get the vaccine and they're not going to get smallpox anyways because the vaccine works. So there still might not even have been a reason to mandate it in the way in the way that it is now, right? Like, I mean, I mean it's, it's it was very it was mandated thing. in certain places, but it was never mandated in the way that um, we are seeing the COVID nineteen vaccines being mandated. And this is the dark thing. I mean, like we've we've never seen like the idea of essentially telling people you cannot earn a living, uh, you cannot get on a bus and go across town. Um, you cannot get on a metro, go across town. I mean, these, these are completely disproportionate to the risk and the benefits that these, these that the virus represents and the vaccine represents. So, so yeah, I think that we are probably one of the most terrifying aspects of what we, are, what we have lived through so far in Europe, for example, over the last eight to nine years, is the fact that people have been conditioned to this idea of having to present their identity, present their vaccine status in order to access the most basic of amenities, basic of services, basic of venues. And it's, it's this kind of normalization of this kind of checkpoint, digital checkpoint society that we should be extremely concerned about. Because uh, if, if the vaccine passport has achieved I would say it's achieved two things. It has set up 
to a certain extent, the infrastructure needed to create a digital identity system, um, not just nationwide, but you would say region-wide and, and eventually worldwide, but also it has um, conditioned people to this idea of um, having to show their identity at any given turn in order to access the most basic of things. And many people have accepted this. And that, I think, mm -hmm. is truly worrying. It's just like a small sacrifice. People think, nah, you know, it's, it's not that big an issue. Once you've established this digital identity, right? Like if it was, if it was siloed to just the vaccine, then that would be one thing and troublesome as it is, you know, to, to segregate people based on their vaccination choices, particularly in this instance, that's worrisome. But the, the big worry is that once you've established this digital ID system, then all of the elements of what we've seen in the CCP's social credit score can be then also linked in. So measurement of what food we're eating, how many how much, how many car, what we're driving in our car, or uh, let's say there's environmental causes that are pushed in into this, or, or even what we're posting on social media, or like there's so many different ways that there's mechanisms of control now available to governments that have shown that immediately when we, when they are given control, they will use it. That is the paradigm. That's the myth that they live in is that if they have the ability to control more, they will control more. They've, every government has proven that time and time again, right? Whether it's the Patriot Act or whether it's the emergency, you know, the emergency use authorization acts or whatever these things are, as soon as a government has power, they use it. And this is what's really scary about this, right? Yeah, I mean, we've seen countless examples of this. Um, the Canadian government said they would not use um, the the contact tracing um, technologies to track people's locations, etc., etc., And they did exactly that. You've got a case in Germany where they actually used the contact, the contact tracing app to try to solve a crime. Um, again, just like a complete um, overreach of what that technology was supposed to be used for. Um, so government does have... I mean, if we had the most trustworthy government and we had these kinds of technologies in place, then then there would still be risks because that government could change at any moment in a democratic society. The problem is, is we don't have governments that have shown themselves to be trustworthy with this kind of a level of power. An example, the best example would be the UK. So the British government, while it was telling people that they had to stay at home, while it was telling people they couldn't, um, hug their family members while well, I was telling people that they they couldn't meet with members of other households they were having parties at 10 Downing mm. Street they were like I mean it was it's this kind of like this rule rule for us um, rules for them not for us is it this this idea that we can um, we have to be able to trust our government if we're going to give them this much power and there's no way that we can trust our governments I think in most cases um, given their performance over the last two years, and I would say going back long before that, um, so you're you're absolutely right. It's a it's a huge amount of uh, control and influence to have in in the hands of of whether it's representative government, whether it's companies, because it's not just governments; it's the companies that are going to be the third parties that are going to be managing these systems. So. So, I mean, like, whether that's Microsoft, whether that is a company like Palantir, which is managing a lot of health data in the UK. I mean, Palantir is a company that was set up by the CIA in 2003. And it's been, its main area of focus has been like military, industrial intelligence complex. And now it's working uh, more and more in the healthcare industries in the US and the UK. So it is, it is, it goes beyond just government. Where do you see, where do you see the, the next, you know, if you were going to say like, all right, if this is the first step, do you, do you have a hypothesis as where the second step might go? You know, like, how does this, 
how does this go from where it is in the worst case? And then let's talk about the best case of how, you know, how we can resist this okay. potential reality. So what's, what's the worst case scenario as you see it played out? I mean, I think rather than maybe talking about the worst case scenarios, we should talk about what's, what's really actually happening. So, I mean, sure. on the one hand, with the vaccine passports, so they're kind of like moving to the background right now. Um, they're, 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 they're being consigned to the back burner, but, but they're not going away. So, I mean, in all the countries where we're being told that, you know, they're withdrawing the vaccine passport rules, what's happening is they're suspending them. They're not cancelling them. At the same time, you've got the World Health Organization is talking about um, adopting the vaccine, pass- uh, vaccine passport recommendations for all of its 993 mem- signatory states. And if this were to happen, this would basically mean that not only would these vaccine passports become permanent feature of our you know reality especially when it comes to travel and and tourism they will also become uh, a universal feature of the world um the legal the legal landscape in the world and that is that is terrifying because there are a lot of countries in the world that haven't adopted vaccine passports so so on the one hand we're being told one narrative which is that we are going to we are seeing this drift away in reality the, the, the most likely pro, um, outcome is that we're going to see it become a permanent, universal feature of, of, of our lives. So that's one element that we should be very concerned about. Secondly, governments are pushing hard with digital identity. So wherever you look, uh, you've got, whether it's the European Union, whether it's the UK, whether it's Canada, whether it's Australia, whether it's New Zealand, um, you have... Governments are developing digital identity programs that, as, as you mentioned earlier, are going to be f- have far broader applications for, the, for our daily lives. Um, they are going to, just looking at the European Union uh, digital identity wallet, which is likely to come into function in the next 10 to 12 months, this is going to include... Um, things like your health records, vaccine status. It will allow you to access public services um, across the European Union territory. Um, It will also uh, include your social media passwords. So, I mean, like everything is, like you said, everything is linked together. Um, So that is something that we're likely to see come online in the next year to two years. And at the same time, what probably most scares me, if you ask me what, what is the kind of like worst case scenario, I would say central bank digital currencies. Mm-hmm. Uh, because that is a fundamental element of what is happening right now. Um, we have, I mean, in China has already launched a central bank digital currency. The digital yuan is already live and is being used in more than 10 regions and cities in China. Um, so it's not, it's not universal yet, but it's, you know, that they are rolling it out bit by bit, but it's definitely so let's back being, up. Let's back up one second yeah. and let's explain because it seems like money is already digital. You know, like I very rarely touch cash, you know, sometimes I do. Um, and usually I'm having a lot of fun when I do. And, uh, and, but if I'm not, I'm not usually handling cash. It's all on a, it's on a credit card somewhere. It's on numbers on a screen and the numbers go up and down and things move. So it 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 feels to, you know, it could feel to me like, well, fuck, we already have digital currency and the central banks have the freedom to print as much as they want. They just can't take mine yet at all. And, um, but what is the, what is the difference for those? And I know a little bit, but what is the difference between a central bank digital currency and just normal fiat currency expressed digitally. Well, I mean, a fiat currency expressed digitally is what, which is what we have right now, is um, this is money that uh, we will have um, through the private banking system. So we have a bank account with our bank, and when money shifts, money moves. It is constantly having to be debited and credited within 
the various banking um, institutions, and then eventually those banking institutions have to um, have to settle those um, payments with the with the central bank. So it's a very it, ironically it's a very decentralized system. Mm-hmm. Um, which has become more and more consolidated. We've seen banks, large banks, grow larger and larger and have more and more power. Um, and they wield, you know, if you're looking at, for example, the United States, you've got um, organized companies like JP Morgan Chase, JP Goldman Sachs have a huge amount of influence over the Federal Reserve. Um, so it's, but it is a largely decentralized system. Um, we, in the case of central bank digital currencies, you would essentially have a much simpler system where the central bank, you know, we would all have uh, an account with the central bank. And we would, rather than having it through through the various banks that, that, that we may have, have accounts with, we would have um, an account with the central bank. And this would apparently be a lot safer so you're less likely to have bank runs um, and you are, you know, th- there would be other benefits. Um, but in my view, the benefits are massively, massively outweighed by the risks mm-hmm. and the dangers. And those risks and dangers include um, the fact that the central bank will be able to control just about everything. They'll be able to keep constant tracking that they'll be able to track and trace all our uh, uh, how we use money how we spend money which is just the ultimate mechanism of control right like if they can stop us from buying groceries or going to the bank you know going to the uh, gas station or using our using our money if they can stop that then they really have absolute control i mean they they control everything about our lives i mean you can say like when we are using digital uh, fiat currency, I mean, like that money is very traceable. But cash provides this, um, what should we say, this anonymity, this privacy that um, probably would not exist in a central bank digital, digital currency world. So, I mean, like it's unlikely the CBD, that the central banks will permit competition in that way once they have the CBDCs launched. Um, the, the president of the Bank of International Settlements, which is the central bank of central banks, um, Agustin Carstens, um, he said something along the lines of, uh, we must distinguish, um, I'm paraphrasing here, uh, we must distinguish between uh, cash and central bank digital currency. When when somebody spends a hundred dollars or thousand pesos in cash, we have no idea where that money goes. But when we do it with a central bank digital currency, we will have complete clarity, complete control over all of that um, transaction. And it's it's a terrifying idea. Um, just just the fact that that everything will be transparent. I mean, it'd be great for government because they will be able to tax us and they will even possibly be able to just go into your account and take your money. Um, if you have a parking fine, they'll be able to go into your, your account and take your money. Um, the scary thing is if they decide to increase taxes, they will just be able to go into your account and take your money. It's, it's an incredible arbitrary power that they will have. Um, mm-hmm. At the same time, there is this, this other element, which is the programmable element of the currency, which would mean that central banks could, if they wanted to, um, choose what we should be allowed to spend our money on. Mm -hmm. And we have, the Bank of England has been talking about this reasonably openly. It was reported in the Daily Telegraph. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's the idea that maybe there are certain Certain things, you know, if you're buying a bit too much alcohol on a weekly basis, and maybe that, that you know, there will come a moment when they, they, you, know, you will no longer be able to get um, alcohol on a Friday night or a Saturday night, or if you are maybe having weight issues. And also, this could come in. Uh, if you're having weight issues with, then, with energy or alcohol issues, then you can 
buy more alcohol is probably how the actual government would work. That's all you can buy. But if you're having weight issues, then, then you can thing. only buy fast food just to accelerate. I mean, I'm just I'm just joking, of course. But of course, there would, would be these humanitarian, uh, these, these guises of humanitarian, oh, this will be good for us. We'll be able to help you. But it's all in this overstepping, devouring mother, big brother, you know, like we, you can't figure this out for yourself. So we're going to help you be your parent for the rest of your life. Yeah, it's a, it's exceptionally paternalistic. It opens that door to kind of that level of paternalism. Um, and it's, it's like in the Chinese uh, social credit system, certain behaviors, most people would say are undesirable. So if somebody is um, throwing litter in the street, if somebody's not cleaning up the, their dog's excrement on the street, then yeah, probably most people would say that that is undesirable and maybe a little slap on the wrist is not a bad thing. The danger is, is that when you get to the point where government is able to decide what all thought and behavior is desirable and undesirable. And that goes into, and that includes what, what political ideas what political statements, what political behavior people um, people do. And it's it's that that is where it gets really scary. Um, we've yeah. already seen a glimpse of that in Canada in the last three or four weeks. With them able to just freeze people's accounts because of the protests that yes. they've been doing. So they've already they've already exercised some of these and obviously it's in the courts and it's getting sorted out. What what would be the, how would this transition work? Like how would they get people to buy into this? Would they say, all right, you can change your dollar, $1 of, of fiat US dollars gets you $1 of central bank digital currency. And then they would, uh, presumably they could force us to do that. You know, at some point, I mean, or would they say, okay, we're only accepting tax payments in central bank digital currency. So you have to, at the very least, convert some of your money into central bank digital currency to even pay us. And then it just starts that way. And then they use like the wheels of convenience and all of these things before exerting the control that scares the shit out of everybody. Yeah, I mean, I think that something... My personal feeling is like having seen what has happened over the past two years... In order to get people to accept such a massive change, they will probably need another crisis. This is what I fear um, for for it to be, because they need everybody to be involved. Um, a little bit like with the vaccine passports, you need at least the vast majority of people on board. So literally just telling people, look, we've got this new money system that is going to have certain... Um, applications that could benefit you. I mean, I don't think you're going to get that much of a buy-in. Um, but, I mean, we've been hearing for the last five, six, seven years from organizations like the International Monetary Fund that we need a monetary reset. And many other organizations, I mean, like the the CEO of BlackRock has been quite vocal in talking about how, you know, we need a complete change of system. And I think that the great C reset forms, uh, you know, that, that is, this is an important part of the so-called great reset. We've reached a stage where the financial system is in, I think, pretty dire straits. It, yeah, I talked about that on my podcast with Fabio Vigi, how we're playing a game of musical chairs yes. where we had to make a extraordinarily bold move in the creation of vast amounts of money and the distribution of that money direct to consumer, which is in an unprecedented way. And this was recommended by BlackRock before the pandemic. We needed to produce an extraordinary amount of money, distribute it direct to the consumer, and also freeze the movement of that money through like the middle class small business sector. We needed to freeze that to prevent hyperinflation, which would be a natural consequence. And magically, all of those conditions appeared in the creation of all of the stimulus money, the slowdown of the economy, preventing the circulation of the money, except towards those higher, bigger, larger corporate institutions, which could absorb 
that amount of money, which is why all the billionaires got more billionaire after that, you know, after this thing is because they could actually absorb the wealth and prevent some of the hyperinflation, which of course we're seeing some of that, some of that high level of inflation now. But the, it, it felt like after talking to Fabio, like we were actually in, you know, a very difficult position with our existing monetary system and some pretty strong moves needed to be made. Otherwise, there was going to be kind of systemic upheaval and collapse, which obviously those people who are in the citadels that would have collapsed want to fight more than anybody, right? You know, it's, and, and, and of course, there would be some down, you know, trickling down disaster if, if, the, if the tall citadels of financial capital fell, of course. It's not, it's, it's, it's not something that we want to really see. Uh, this is the thing. If you actually saw the sort of, um, I mean, in Europe, in North America, we've not seen a kind of the sort of global, uh, the sort of financial collapse that a country like Argentina has seen over the last 20 years. Um, Argentina saw real bank runs in the Corralitos of 2001-2002 and it decimated the middle class. It totally destroyed the middle class and that country is absolutely dependent on the generosity of, I, I put that in inverted commas of the International Monetary Fund. Um, so you have an economy which is one of the strongest in Latin America and you've seen just this spiral downwards. Um so we've not been through a sort of crisis like that and and we should be grateful for that but i fear that that it is a question it is a matter of time um because like you said we've not seen the hyperinflation that many people were warning about with this huge amount of money creation that that kicked in um in the first few months of the pandemic but we are seeing rapidly rising inflation and you know the us i think it's almost eight percent uh, which is actually higher than it is in mexico um, in spain where i'm living it's around 7.5 percent and these are the highest levels of inflation in like going back four decades um, it's that that should scare us because you know the war in russia between um, russia and ukraine is also kind of like unleashing huge uh, destabilizing forces and the energy energy is going up enormously and if that continues i mean energy is a component in everything we consume it's in everything that is produced so if you begin to see kind of like these spiraling uh, energy prices then we are we could be seeing a very very um destructive kind of like economic scenario at the same time that the central banks are trying to bring inflation under control by raising interest rates and that is just squeezing the life out of the economy mm -hmm. so it's 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 debatable to what extent central banks will be able to actually bring this inflation under control because so much of it is beyond simple monetary um, causes. I mean, like you are looking at, um, I and mean, one of the fundamental things that happened in 2020 is we unleashed an unprecedented amount of money at the same time as economic activity ground to a standstill. Mm -hmm. So even though, like you said, most of the money went up to the kind of like institutions um, closely connected to the central banks, um, even then, given just how little movement the economy was happening in the economy, we're still already seeing, we, we, also, we already began to see some serious inflation. So mm -hmm. it's, if they try to bring this under control by increasing interest rates, which is already happening in certain, with certain central banks, then it won't take much for, for us to begin to see this kind of like stagflationary scenario where you have an economy that's not growing at the same time that inflation is, 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 is dangerously high. And that yeah. is not a good place to be. Through my crazy travel schedule, I have learned that I want to travel light and effective. And one of the best ways to do that is to travel with all of Onnit's instant collection. Alpha Brain Instant, New Mood Instant, 
Hydratech. It's super easy. All you do is you tear off the little strip here, you pour it in water, and you get the instant effects of these formulas that we worked on for a decade. Formulas that I don't want to leave home without that can help in the case of Alpha Brain, get you more focused, put you in this productive flow so you can get the shit done that you want to get done. And of course, New Mood to help you relax, stay calm, stay centered. It's the great yin yang of the Onnit formulas. And of course, Hydratech, anytime you're sweating, working out hard, all of these are available on it.com slash Aubrey and you'll save 10%. Once again, that's on it.com slash Aubrey. It felt, it felt very much after talking to Fabio and looking at some of the macroeconomic conditions that there was very few moves left on the board yeah. to keep the system, keep the yeah. system running. So you don't even have to presuppose like absolute tyrannical villainy to just say, all right, the system itself is trying to preserve itself and there's not a lot of moves left to be made and the dying system is in its final spasms and there's you know, in this great reset, there actually is a reason for something to change. Now, the solution that they have for that thing to change is particularly dangerous because it opens up all of the vectors of control, like we talked about. But there are there are massive problems with our monetary system. It seems as though that, you know, those people with large amounts of money are who really seem to be the driving force behind, you know, they call BlackRock the fourth branch of government, and they might be the first branch of government, you know, to be honest. It seems like money really is calling the shots here. Seems like the wealthy are not going to be willing to not be wealthy. So somehow, whatever happens, the wealthy are going to stay wealthy. Like, we can we can bet on that, right? Like, that's the that's the general idea, unless some fundamental other thing happens but it seems like those who are running the banks the banks are still going to have a place at the table it's going to be very interesting how they make these moves to transfer over into this and then also how they deal with this alternate parallel structure which may very well have the solution already built in which is cryptocurrency right like there's this alternate parallel structure that's already been developing that is potentially you know an element of the solution that obviously the governments don't like because they can't use it to control it's the opposite of control it's radical freedom and sovereignty and the ability to use money in and maintain your privacy in that use so that becomes a real threat to this system but also if if the governments can get out of their their own delusion and distortion of control they can realize like oh actually a new system is already developing and if we can just help work with you know get out of the way people's own creativity and our own ability to find solutions will will ultimately take over it's an interesting one i mean like what the the place of s- cryptocurrencies in in a new reality where you have central bank digital currencies i would be surprised if they allow that degree of competition uh, just as i'd be surprised if they allow cash to last much longer um that's not to say that cryptocurrencies would not exist it's just that they're more likely to kind of like be pushed to the fringes even more so than they are today but again it's not easy to know because there are so many suppositions we have to make um i think one thing that is clear is that like you said the wealthy or should i say the super wealthy are determined to hold on to what they have. Um, this idea, um, f- the as the French say, plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. The more things change, the more they stay the same. And we're going mm-hmm. through one of these huge inflection points where it seems that like everything is changing. But the goal is to keep things in place, um, at least for those who have power, and not just keep them in place. The only way they can keep things in place for themselves is by expanding their power and that is where because so i think so many people if we go through the sort of economic crisis that we've been kind of forestalling with every burst bubble if we go through that mother of all economic crises then there's going to be 
potentially billions of people who are going to be suddenly find that their standard of living is is not what it was and in a big way and people who are already kind of like struggling to make ends meet are going to find themselves not making them not making ends meet so how do you maintain control in a scenario like that i mean like the only way is with the kind of control systems that digital technologies allow um but whether or not they're going to pull it off i do think that is that is not guaranteed by any means uh if we go back in time 6 7 years to 2014 2015 it seemed that the trade agreements like the tpp and ttip and tisa these three huge trade agreements were going to radically reconfigure the you know the global economy the way corporations function vis-a-vis governments etc cetera, etc cetera. and something happened which wasn't remotely part of the script i mean donald trump won the us elections and with a stroke of a pen he basically cancelled years and years of um coordinated work among the largest corporations on the planet so it's not like they win every time and i don't think that is by any means guaranteed you can have your best laid plans but i think we are going through an exceptionally turbulent time and um, so yeah so whether or not i mean it's, yeah it's, i mean if they come for if if they come for crypto let's say i mean there's they're going to reach some serious opposition you know like this is now there's a lot of people who are deeply invested not only financially but emotionally into this and and also starting to build infrastructure on the backs of these currencies and yeah. so the the longer the longer that these things have traction the harder they are to they hard the harder they are to stop you know like the true. more the true. more difficult it is to is to make these moves so i mean it um, could be the crypto becomes kind of like if you imagine a world where they get rid of cash which i mean like if you look at a lot of the largest banks the organize the tech firms um the credit card companies i mean like these giant corporations they've made it very clear over the last 10 years that their biggest enemy is cash so i mean like if they if they're able to get rid of cash then cryptocurrencies could have a purpose even for kind of like governments and intelligence agencies because it's a way of you know maybe continuing the black ops continuing ways of kind of like avoiding the control grid and that is what the super wealthy always try to do it's like you know the the keeping an eye on tax and making sure everybody's paying taxes is all well and good for the 98% of the population um but those 2% that have their money in the tax havens um perhaps the crypto system the cryptocurrencies will, will allow that to continue um so it's it's hard yeah to i mean i guess the danger the danger would be if let's say they let's say they got rid of fiat Uh-huh. you know and somehow pulled that nobody really nobody really is a as a champion of fiat other than the fact that like it's dangerous to get rid of it obviously but if they got rid of that and then they prevented the exchange between bitcoin let's say and central bank digital currency so then you could actually you would create two entirely alternate economies except one of those alternates was the only way that you could pay taxes and if you didn't pay taxes then you go to jail. Uh that's an option. That's a possibility. So you create and this is the thing I mean like basically you have a system where you have a dual system and you know there have been um uh, writers that have imagined this kind of world um where you have you know different means it, it would almost be like a barter system for those on the very edge of society and but it it would be a precarious existence because you would have a yeah. government that is extremely has a, incredible powers of surveillance and control and you would be on the fringes of that using cryptocurrency that that is one possibility 
Um, but yeah. at least it gives an option. At least it would give an option. What is the, where do you think, I mean, it seems like this vaccine passport is the, is the gateway to this, you know, digital ID system, which is the gateway to the central bank digital currency, which is the gateway to all of these mechanisms of control. Albeit granted, on the other side, there are solutions that that are helpful, and there are there is plausible reasons, if you supposed good actors in the government that they were actually acting with integrity and for our best interests, which has certainly come into question recently more than ever, but likely has been always the case. And I think our our founders of at least the United States, we were aware of that. I mean, we built in as many protections as we could against what was seen as the inevitable the inevitable lust for power that governments always have. You know, I mean, this is our, many of our amendments to our Bill of Rights are, are really based upon these premises of trying to protect us against our government as, as much as anything, right? So we, we've, we've built in, they tried to build in enough rights for protections against this moment. And so it's, uh, it's, an, interesting, it's an interesting thing, but it seems like the first point of resistance is now like the point the strongest point of resistance we can make is to prevent step one because if we all adopt step one it gets really slippery and harder to prevent subsequent steps from from happening beyond that and i think that's kind of a big part of the point that you're making that now is the time to stand in resistance to the the vaccine passport itself not necessarily because of the vaccine passport which has its own fucking problems We, we know that but because it is the gateway to all of these other dystopic realities. Absolutely. I mean, like the U.S. is uh, is in in a certain way in a privileged position um, because, like you said, it has probably the best designed constitution on the planet. It has the the founders had the wisdom to realize the importance of putting those checks and balances on power which I would argue we don't have to the same extent in most European countries. And to be honest, to be fair, like in Europe, the European Union has taken so much of the sovereignty of countries in Europe that it would be very difficult for a, a member state of the European Union to, to oppose the direction of travel. Um, so, yeah. and... Really, I mean, like in the US, you've had like some serious pushback from within the courts, which is something we've not really seen in Europe. There have only been, as far as I'm aware, two cases where nationals, kind of like high court or supreme courts, have said, look, this is anti constitutional. Mm-hmm. And in both cases, within three or four weeks, those this rulings were overturned mm-hmm. by some other judge. So, I mean, like it's. Um, I would rather be, I have a lot more faith in the US when it comes to kind of like trying to push back. You also have a much more decentralized system of government. Mm-hmm. So yeah, states have states have reasonable rights. And also, as much as the two party system is a fucking problem, <laughs> the way that the, the way that things have gone, actually, everything has been so politicized that yeah. we have one of the two major parties in opposition to a lot of the moves being made by the other party, which in some ways creates this stalemate, which is a big problem and also creates all of this, all of the dark side of the politics that we see, but also it's ultimately like assuming that elections are fair, which is an assumption that, you know, we have to say, we have to say, all right, potentially with the digitization of everything that there's mechanisms of control that are actually undermining the nature of democracy. I don't I don't have nearly enough information to know that, but I know that it has to be at least a credible hypothesis that there is a possibility that elections are not fair. But assuming that they are and assuming uh-huh. that that won't go down without a fight, you know, ultimately if one if one side is being suppressed, yes. there's it's it's an interesting time where there's there's legitimate conflict. This isn't a this isn't a, a slippery slope into this into this path without at least from the u.s perspective you know an ample amount of resistance that's already built in and also continuing to strengthen yeah i mean i think that i mean there have been a few cases that that concerned me a little bit a few moments that have concerned me for example there was a, a vote 
I think it was on a vaccine mandate, one of Biden's vaccine mandates, and two or three Republican senators didn't bother to turn up for the vote. So it was, you know, it was it was more or less a foregone conclusion for the Republican side that they were going to vote it down. And then I think one of them was Mitt Romney, surprisingly, but um, you have an example there. If you've just got a few corrupt or corrupted individuals who mm-hmm. would actually want to see this system put in place, then you just need those those few people to not turn up to vote. Um, that said, I mean, like when you see um, you see Republican governors like uh, DeSantis in Florida who are completely opposing the direction of travel, then that sort of thing does at least create like you know it, it shows that there are alternative options. And there's a yeah. Lot and of so for people for, for people who options. don't know what you're talking about, Ron DeSantis, governor of Florida, is suing. Uh, the what is it the FAA or suing or the suing the CDC for the imposition of masks and restrictions on domestic travel so we have like large large players who are entering into litigation against governmental or at least pseudo governmental agencies so yeah. there's it's an interesting it's an interesting time where it feels like the fate is not yet determined no. and and we have we have s- substantial opportunity to to make a stand and make some we make a stand with our votes and make a stand with our voices um and make a stand here that is important now we might also be in the process and i say we and i i'm not you know i don't have all of the data and i'm not saying i know exactly everything because i can also see like i don't know i don't know this i can't steal man i can't steal man the other the options for central bank digital currency i don't have the awareness to steel man that and say like potentially they're seeing something that is so fucking catastrophic that we're just like focused on yeah all right we have to prevent this maintain sovereignty maintain freedom but we actually aren't privy we don't have the purview of what those people are actually looking at and being like yeah y'all can stand in resistance and if you win like be prepared for the consequences of that of that quote victory yeah. of resisting this and watch the economy itself collapse yeah and and what does that mean you know and like and what is like so it's it's difficult without it's easy to straw man there you know and 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 assume that there's some you know powerful group of elites that only wants power and they're fucking reptilians or something i i have a hard time believing that and i think there is some steel man argument for some of these moves that are being made that i think we may not even be aware of and that's the other that's the other side to I th- this i think that there's argument. certainly one argument for that is the the energy situation so i mean like i've heard lots of people like you know, well-respected economists argue that, you know, one of the reasons we're living through what we're living through is because we don't have the so much um, easily accessible sources of um, carbon-based energy. And we are, you know, this is one of the reasons why we are pushing and we're pushing into kind of like the, the new green transition which is going to be a bumpy ride um especially for as we're already seeing for um truck truck companies small trucking companies and for people who just need to depend on their car to get to and Mm -hmm. from work which in the us is a lot of people so i mean it's um and there's there's possibly an argument for that it's not an area that i know much about but i mean i think that uh, the energy crisis we are living through i mean like i presume that as you say like the people at the very top know the the real situation um Mm -hmm. but but i think that for me the most important issue is the extent to which if we supposedly live in free reasonably free democratic societies is the extent to which things are just happening to us and the extent to which we have a certain degree of agency 
over our lives going forward. And I think that that is the fundamental issue right now. Most people, I think most people are not even aware of what is happening to them. It's it's happening so quickly. It's happening from so many different angles. Right. And people are just trying to get by on a day-to-day basis. And it's like with the vaccine passports, they just want to go back to whatever normality may be and not have to think about things and not have to worry about the virus, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, but I think that we are at risk of kind of like sleepwalking into a, a very dark tyranny that is not, you know, if it's being designed by those at the very top who have shown, let's face it, not much regard for the rest of us over the last 20, 30, 40 years and have been gobbling up the planet's resources and gobbling up the wealth and kind of like sucking it upwards. Um, I mean, that that should concern it. The idea of these people assigning themselves the job of creating the, the world of the future, I'm not sure if they're qualified. <laughs> That's an understatement for sure. <laughs> and, you know, the, the, other, the other concern is, all right, let's say that we are in a crisis of carbon-based energy. And there was like, ah, oh, well, no worries. It's Tesla and there's, you know, electrical cars and all that. That's still relying on rare earth minerals yes. to create batteries, right? Like we're still not, we still haven't transcended the resource crisis. We've just shifted the resource crisis to, oh, yes. okay, well, we're out of oil, but now we still got to mine lithium and we got to mine, you know, all of these other rare earth minerals. And that could become the next crisis until we kind of transcend those mechanisms of energy. And then the other, the other options, obviously there's nuclear energy, but that as we've seen with Fukushima and it's, it's a, that's a fucking hazardous energy, especially in a cat- cataclysmic planet, you know, a planet where tsunamis occur and fucking earthquakes occur and all kinds of crazy shit happens and always has and always has, you know, so there's, there's a, a lot of difficult options that are being made, but what we would want, if it, what we would want would be a government that would say, hey, we're facing some gnarly shit and there's a lot of bad options here and we're trying to choose the best of the bad options and this is what it plays out if we don't do this. This is how it could play out if we do do this and like just continue to to make the case and open up, you know, open source their own thinking and their own mindset and the fact that they aren't doing that is at the very least egregiously condescending to our own intelligence and also very likely there's a hidden agenda a hidden a hidden drive to power and a a desire to maintain power which is preventing them from the transparency that which could actually get everybody on the same page here exactly i mean like if you have a in this sort of like existential crisis that we may be facing, if you have a government whose primary interest, like for example in the US, um, congressmen and women whose primary concern is their their stock holdings and where they're invested, um, they clearly aren't thinking about their voters. And the same goes if you're a minister who is just waiting for payday when you get a a nice little board position with BlackRock or a nice board position with Goldman Sachs. I mean, like this is or an FDA, an FDA, an FDA, you know, representative that gets a big cushy, you know, consultancy job with the pharmaceuticals. We're entangled. We're the yeah. people are being captured, and even if they're not captured by their own personal financial resources, if you're a career politician, you're beholden to the contributions that allow you to spend the money that allow you to win the election so you know as i was talking to brett weinstein you know recently i was saying what is the meta crisis that we're facing and he says the meta crisis we're facing is capture yeah. that people are captured by economic incentives and incentives that can drive whether you win the election or don't win the election or potentially even your own personal your personal wealth and your own personal allocation of wealth so this this problem of capture which is another way of saying corruption is 
but it doesn't even have to be all the way there. It could just be the self-serving bias, their ability to see things in a way that serves their ability to win and justifies their ability to win. Well, I'm the best qualified. I got to make some compromises. You got to break a couple eggs. You know, you got to make some compromises. This is the nature of politics. It's, you know, the, this kind of house of cards mentality that show that was, you know, really popular for a while of like understanding how the system itself is captured. You know, it's captured and and with that is elements of corruption and at the very least bias. Yeah, I mean, I think that very large elements of corruption. I mean, like we've, conflicts of interest are like the business model of politics. And we are, we are not changing that. We are just, we're giving the keys of government to the likes of BlackRock. I mean, BlackRock is choosing which assets the Federal Reserve buys, despite the fact that BlackRock is the largest manager of assets on the planet. Um, mm-hmm. it's, that is the most insane conflict of interest imaginable, but it's, it's doing exactly the same in, with the European Central Bank. So it's, um, it's, we've reached that stage where it's really difficult to, to, to see where a central bank ends and BlackRock begins or to see where the federal the FDA ends and Pfizer begins and I don't see any sign in any government of any movement towards rectifying this or even pausing it and, yeah. and that that to me tells me you know we are if we are coming towards a major major crisis um our government is not on our side in any shape or form. And whether or not it's like they've got a big agenda, I mean, like fundamentally, they are not being honest to us. Mm-hmm. And they are clearly in the pockets of companies that have very different interests. I mean, just looking at the World Economic Forum, um, an organization that has, is whose founder is proud to have infiltrated governments of democratic countries around the world. Um, I mean, like that organization, I think if you look at the top 10 um, largest market cap firms in the United States, eight of them are sponsors of the World Economic Forum. And in Europe, it's like 18 out of 20. All of the major, major, major too big to fail banks are, are putting money into the World Economic Forum. The World Economic Forum is has spent decades subverting government. Yeah. This this reality that that we're facing is scary on a lot of fronts, you know, for sure. And it seems that now because of the pollution of what you could call the epistemic commons, the ability to access information, it's very difficult for people to make sense of anything that's going on. And in that confusion is, you know, opportunity, opportunity for, you know, moves to be made unconscious to what we're actually aware of. And that's, that's scary. And it's now falling on the impetus of people to try and sort the truth themselves which we're not even really equipped to sort you know i'm not fucking equipped to understand macroeconomic conditions like i i don't know you know I, i'm equipped to understand spiritual situ- spiritual issues and philosophical issues i mean this is what i've dedicated the last 23 years of my life to exploring and trying to understand but of course when you learn how to think about something you can start to apply it and as soon as you do that you start to see all of the the different cracks in the system and you start to make you know just putting your mind in the in the in the potential chessboard of what's happening in the world things start to be concerning and i think one of the so again so we have one problem is is that now the onus is on us to figure some shit out first of all which you know a lot of us are, are realizing and there's a lot of biases that we're going to have there's a lot of emotions that we're going to have there's a lot of ways that we can fall into the same traps of the things that we're fighting against like don't dehumanize us don't be a sheep and you're like what do you mean you don't you can't be fighting against dehumanization and calling the people on the other side a sheep Absolutely. that's literally dehumanization right like Absolutely. there's traps that we can fall in that are actually supporting the system itself even though we think we're in resistance so we have to be really mindful of the plays that we make and also the suppositions that we that we have and i think that's important one thing that i wanted to 
to mention is, is that, you know, before the pandemic happened, coincidence or not, there was a simulation that was made simulating what would happen if a pandemic actually happened, right? And that simulation, that simulation was carried out and then a pandemic happened. Could be coincidence. I don't know. Um, the latest, there is recently another simulation for a large scale cyber terror attack. And so if you play this out, like, okay, let's say that you do suppose and just adopt the hypothesis that the simulation is somehow linked to the event actually happening. And if the cyber attack simulation is now pointing the direction to what the next thing would be, this could also play into this central bank digital currency move by imagine, <clears throat> let's say all of a sudden, all of our banks, all of our banks got got kind of hacked, attacked, and all of our assets through all of the banks, through all of the credit card companies got frozen. Like like literally none of nothing worked. Our credit cards didn't work. The bank, like the banking system couldn't register how much money we had. It just happened for a week. Let's say, let's say all of that was down for a week. I mean, absolute chaos in that point. And then in the absolute chaos of that, then comes, you know what? The only solution to this is to bring the entire power of our government behind the protection of your money, right? Like, so this is just a hypothetical. I'm not saying this is going to fucking happen, but who knows? You have to play these scenarios out in which okay, let's say this thing happens, all of our banks, all of the credit cards, our Amexes, our Visas, none of this shit fucking works for a long time. And then the chaos that ensues when that, that happens. And then a solution is provided as a remedy for that chaos. The solution being, listen, listen, we got this shit on lock. We got all of the, the top cybersecurity experts in our government, the entire government and all of its protection and all of its military and intelligence might will protect your money. I mean, that's a pretty fucking strong play. If that's the play, if that's the play, and it's they're not they're not being honest, that's a pretty strong play, right? And that's that's also scary. And and again, no no suppositions that this will, and no, no I'm not presupposing the entity that is deciding that this will, but it's something to just be mindful of that we've seen it. We've seen an event occur where there was this that I think it's event two hundred one it was called, which then was an antecedent to the to the pandemic and then now they're doing these cyber terror things and you could see how another crisis like that could then lead to a stronger a stronger play i think they've done two so i mean like we talk about the world economic forum here and it was uh cyber polygon i think was the name of the simulation and the first one was last year no, the first one is, was in 2020. The second one was in 2021. Ironically, I think the one in 2021 involved a Russian bank, Spirit Bank, um, although it might have been the one in 2020. I don't remember very clearly. I do mention it in my book. Um, but yes, there have been two large simulations of a serious cyber attack. Um, causing serious problems for the global economy. And one of those, I think, was related to the financial system. Um, mm -hmm. For me, one of the terrifying things, we're, we're speculating here, we're, we have no mm -hmm. idea if this is possible or if this can happen or if this will happen. But there are two things that I would mention. One, last year saw an absurd number of bank IT outages. It wasn't recorded... It wasn't reported on very much, but I mean, like if you if you look at, um, for example, Latin America, I write a lot about Latin America. So uh, on about three or four occasions, the biggest bank in Mexico went down on a Sunday completely. The IT system went down um, in Venezuela. The biggest bank went down for about four or five days um, in Ecuador. The biggest bank went down for a few days. Um, the one of the biggest banks in um, in Japan, which I think is called Misuo, has suffered something like nine or ten 
IT outages over the last year. It's 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 suffered so many problems that its CEO and its chairman were forced to resign. Um, so I mean, like there's there's been and in the UK it's crazy. In the UK, like every month, there will be an outage of at least um, three or four of the major banks. So it's like this is happening uh, all over the world, and. And it's showing a serious fragility within the system, at the very least. It's showing a very mm-hmm. serious fragility within the, the commercial banking system. And that should worry us. But so secondly, the other thing I would say is that the beauty of having, if something like this were to happen, if we were to have a cyber attack that brought down, just it, wouldn't, it probably wouldn't need to be all the banks. It would just need to be a few of the banks the major banks um, and the sort of chaos that would that would ensue the beauty of that for the kind of like the the banks and the wall street investors you know the, who have been running the show for the last however many decades is that the narrative when it came to actually writing the history of why the system went down it would be due to a cyber attack it wouldn't be due to all the systemic flaws and problems that existed long before. Mm. It wouldn't be due to the fact that we were we had accumulated absurdly unsustainable levels of debt, mm-hmm. whether private debt or public debt. It would be simply one event, and whether or not they could blame that on Russians or whatever, it is... Um, it is a, a very disturbing thought because what that would mean is that that could usher in the kind of new reality, the monetary reset they're talking about. And they'll be able to do it in a kind of like a very quick way and it would be a shock, it would be a crisis. And they would be able to write it in such a way that they didn't come out as responsible in any way. Especially now, and this is what I was just going to mention and you arrived at a very similar spot. I mean especially now we've all many of us have heard Putin's speech about that he's going to meet any aggression with aggression right and so we are we are pushing different kind of monetary sanctions and restrictions against Russia right we have somebody who's said okay you fuck with us i fuck with you back right Putin's pretty clear on that so we already have like the easiest the easiest layup of somebody to blame you know and it, it certainly could be him i don't know i mean we don't know what any of this is going to happen we're just as a ceo like this is the thing like people say oh cut fucking conspiracy theory i was a ceo of a company called on it for and many people who are listening know this for 10 years and part of being a ceo is looking at all of the different potential areas of risk that good actors or bad actors or incompetence or or you know designed designed malice could actually how they could actually affect you what what litigation pathways are available what ways what ways could you make a mistake honestly what ways could somebody attack you dishonestly you look at that you just look at all of that it's part of premeditation it's stoic philosophy it's trying to figure out what might happen and so the negation of our ability to think about that because you get labeled as something and then outcast and then used as a term of denigration, that's crazy. Like in a, in a crisis situation, we have to look at all possible all possible areas of threat. This is not, not conspiracy theorizing. This is just looking at the game board of possible threats. And in this game board, one possible threat could be that Russia has not only the motive to actually do it, if they wanted to do it and also arguably potentially the capability to do it because our system is inherently fragile which is also the argument for a blockchain based you know internet system the new internet 3.0 which would actually be a lot safer uh-huh. but but nonetheless even if it wasn't russia who did it we got and there was another agency and i'm not saying there are it's just looking at the whole game board if there was another agency who was behind it they could just go fucking russia did it they told us they were going to do it and Russia did it, you know, and then that actually makes it really easy to push this. And then, then they could rally national support against Russia, create this kind of conflict type of situation. And then in the nationalists, like 
if you don't if you don't support central bank digital currency you are supporting russia and you're not and then they tap into our patriotism and then our patriotism rallies and our nationalism rallies and everybody's like come on don't be a you know don't be a russian supporter support this whole thing you can see how all of these intricate narratives could play out and that's you know just it's important to look at all of these potential options before they happen so we're aware of the moves that could be made and if you imagine Imagine a scenario where there's no internet for four days. I mean, it's almost impossible to imagine. Mm -hmm. Um, Just about nothing works. And most of us can't work. Most of us can't earn a living. And we can't access our money. It would be chaos. Um, It is essentially unimaginable. And if you think about how willing people were to kind of like to to do what seemed to be the right thing in terms of getting the vaccine, getting the vaccine passport, doing all the things that, you know, that was laid out, that this is the right thing to do. Imagine how desperate they will to do will be to do the right thing in a crisis of that magnitude. It's um, I, I. really don't think this is what's going to happen but it's completely within within the realms of possibility Mm -hmm. i think that there is like i said the scary thing for me is like as somebody who's been like watching the economy for the last 15 years or so since the global financial crisis it is the ability to to control the narrative of blame and if you are at the very top and you have benefited from these multiple crises and after each of these crises, you get stronger, you get wealthier. And at the end of all this, there's the, the mother of all wealth destructions, which is going to be the, the crisis, this kind of reckoning of debt. And you're able to say, well, it was this guy's fault. And or is this organization's fault, this shady organization's fault, then it's a it does lend itself to it, it provides the perfect alibi. Um, yeah. That said, I mean, like, Lord knows, it's it's very hard to tell what what could happen. But I think that because of the, the nature, I mean, like the last time we went through kind of like a monetary reset was in the early 1970s when Richard Nixon, all of a sudden, from one moment to the next, took the, um, took the dollar off the gold peg. Mm. And he did this, I think it was largely unexpected from his allies. But because of the fact that the US at that moment was militarily dominant, and because of, you had this kind of like this bipolar world system with between the US and the Soviet Union, US allies went along with it. It wasn't an issue. Now we're facing a very different geopolitical reality. We're facing a moment where I would argue that the US still has the support of, for example, its European allies. But Europe is a declining force on the global stage. And the, the, the countries that are increasing in terms of wealth that have better demographics, they are all in Asia. So, so whether or not, I mean, like how they would be able to engineer a shift of, of such a huge uh, magnitude without doing something absolutely huge, I can't see it happening. I don't think that Joe Biden is going to sit down and say, look, by the way, from now on, <laughs> We, we, we're going to have central bank digital currencies. We would like you all to, to get one, et cetera, et cetera. I don't think that's going to work. In U- Ukraine, you might know this better than me. Ukraine is in the midst of a very chaotic war right now. Yeah. And quietly, they pushed, they rolled out a variety of different conditions. I think include, doesn't it include a central bank digital currency or at least a full digital ID? Yeah, I mean, like they are, they are at the leading edge. As far as I mean, like I've, I've seen the government documents um, in English and 
they are they've launched kind of like a universal basic income program which is tied into the vaccine passport so it's a really interesting it's a really interesting case study of how um, a country could link these things up and it's pushing ahead with central bank digital currency as is russia when you actually look at me, like the number of countries that are pushing ahead with central bank digital currencies, at least experimenting in a big way, you're talking about roughly 110 countries. Around 90 central banks, 110 countries. So, and those countries represent something like 90% of GDP, global GDP. There seems to be two ways to manipulate people. One is through fear and one is through our natural desire to serve our brothers and sisters, our compassion, our love for each other. And both, both of those strategies were a big part of the vaccine narrative, which was be afraid, be very afraid. We're going to show you this death count and exaggerate it at every opportunity that we can. And not that the deaths aren't real and that not that the COVID isn't scary, but certainly the fear was the fear is a powerful way to, you know, to move people. And then people's also another powerful way is to, we want to naturally play our part. We do love each other. We're tribal creatures that at the base of it, we do love each other and do want to come together. And, and the scary thing about war is that heightens both of those things to the maximum. You know, as soon as we got attacked, think of 9-11 for us, we get attacked, the whole country rallies together, you know, minus some, you know, scapegoating to just peaceful Islamic you know, churches and mosques. And there was, there was, it wasn't all perfect. I'm not going to say that, but we rallied together in a really strong and patriotic way. And I'm not also saying that the decisions made afterwards and the legislation, I'm not saying that, but in, in wartime situation, people come together and they accept whole different understandings of what they're, they're acceptable to. And it's scary to think that we're now entering a realm in which kinetic war which was off the table for a long time, like world powers were not gonna fight each other anymore because of mutually assured destruction. It seems like there's now a room where we can actually engage in kinetic war that doesn't involve nu nukes and like those are off the table. And then in under the guise of kinetic war, a lot of these things can pass and happen that normally wouldn't happen. And then the other benefits of the kinetic of kinetic war is it actually is an intensely stimulating force for the economy because you're having labor and effort and technology building things that actually explode. And those things actually explode. And like, so the way that it actually allows to stimulate and, and put labor and labor and effort towards, you know, the creation of something and then the destruction of that thing, there it's a strong economic stimulus. So there's hidden, and even if people aren't choosing this because no one, no one would choose war, there's hidden latent reasons why war could be used in a way, whether subconsciously or consciously, for a variety of different agendas, some being economic and some being to push these mechanisms of control, which may also have economic backing. So it's a, it's a, it's a very interesting game board that's now available. And again, I just want to reiterate, like I'm not saying that I know what moves are being made. I'm not saying that any of this is going to happen or I'm supposing that there's any group that's fucking doing anything. It could be that just all of these things are happening. But I think we have to look at the game board. We have to understand the pieces that are at play and just be mindful because it's really, it really is on us. It really is on us to try and figure this shit out. No, no, without doubt. I think that like you said, we, 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 there are so many moving parts to what is happening right now. I mean, like we've we've been through a pandemic. We're still in a pandemic. We don't know what's going to happen with the pandemic exactly. Um, we the pandemic has unleashed a whole gamut of economic forces that we we really are struggling to to bring under control. And that itself is a heck of a crisis to have to deal with. And then to have a war between a military superpower and a, a neighboring country that is supported by the world's largest military superpower. I mean, like, this is a, 
a dynamic. I mean, I wrote my book, which came, which I finished writing in January. That I'm glad I wrote this paragraph. By the time you read this book, probably things will have changed in a very big way. Now there was no way I could have imagined that there was going to be a war between Ukraine and Russia, and the sort of um, forces that that has unleashed. I think that it's hey we do have an important duty to at least try to understand like you said what is happening um what it seems to me that a lot of what the us is doing and a lot of what the eu is doing is merely pushing people away from the us system of governance us domination uh, when i say pushing countries away i mean like the countries that don't normally count so when, when mm-hmm. the u.s says like the world is with us they're really talking about kind of like the oecd countries they are they're talking about the rich economies um basically europe the u.s and lucky places like japan and south korea australia new zealand etc etc but but even like latin america most latin america countries are not willing to sanction russia there's only two or three countries that have been prepared to go there. Um, China hasn't. India hasn't. Indonesia hasn't. Pakistan hasn't. Bangladesh. So if you look at the countries with the largest populations on the planet, they are not going along with this. So we have a situation where... And, and I think that the economic sanctions that have been leveled against Russia are just pushing people away from the dollar. And that is a a very dangerous force because the US empire, the US US, um, domination of the world over the last 60 or so years, or what I know, it'd be more like 70 years, is really, I mean, like based largely on the reserve currency status. Mm Mm-hmm. So, so we are looking at, yeah, these forces are extremely erratic. You've got multiple actors uh, working at the same time uh, to different ends. And, and what is clear is like in, in, in the case of a country like Russia, in the case of a person like Putin, they will do whatever they can to defend their interests at this mm-hmm. moment, and that can do serious harm. I mean, like, I, I live in Europe, and <laughs> apparently in two, two days, I'm not sure what the situation is right now, but apparently in two days, um, our governments have to pay for the gas in uh, rubles. And at the moment, they said that's not going to happen. And if, 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 this continues and Putin says, okay, well, we're going to cut you off, then that is a huge amount of gas. That is basically yeah. Europe in its worst energy crisis, at least since the 1970s. And it's, uh, it's hard to know where, where that is going to go. Yeah. And really, you know, it's, as I said before, and I just want to clarify this, when I say it's on us, it doesn't mean that all of us need to become economists you know, economists, all of us need to be, become political strategists, all of us need to be aware of all of these things, but we just need to understand that the narratives that we're being fed are captured in many cases, captured by advertisement, captured by other mechanisms of control. So we have to really open our mind and, you know, look to the people who we feel we can really trust in these times because it's not as easy. You can't just turn on the news and they've sorted out the best people for you. Like the curation system of experts is what's really broken. It's not that there aren't experts. It's just that the curation of those experts has been captured. And so we just have to continue to, you know, continue to look, continue to trust our own inner compass towards truth um, and continue to, to live in a way that, that, brings forward brings forward the possibility uh, for something more beautiful to arise we've spent a lot of time talking about a lot of the dystopia but in every crisis is opportunity and i'm not saying that in the pessimistic way like they're going to some other force is going to take advantage of it like this upheaval could be what 
creates a much more beautiful world. And, you know, I think we also have to hold that strong possibility that everything is happening as tragic as it may be, exactly as is needed to bring about a new stewardship of the earth by all humans and all people built on love and respect for each other and our planet. And this is the bumpy middle stages in between that. This is the infancy of that thing, which is really ugly right now. It's all blood and placenta and screams, and but ultimately something more beautiful is birthing. And, and I actually really do believe that's possible. But to shepherd this baby, you know, we need open hearts and active minds and uh and i think that's the that's the spot that we're in yeah i agree i think that number one don't fall for divided rule so i mean like when you are being told to despise your unvaccinated brother or your unvaccinated sister uh don't fall for it um any government that is happy to spread the hate toward a certain minority within the population will be happy to shift the target of that hatred at any given moment. So I think yep. it is really important to to not fall for that, to to try to find, like you said, the things we have in common, the things we share, um, and and to, to try to have reasoned, calm conversations about the situation we're in. Um, these things, I mean, like in my book, I, I say, I mean, like these, whether it's the vaccine passports, whether it's digital identity, whether it's central bank digital currencies, these are things that are kind of being organized around us and above us. Mm -hmm. um, they are not, there, there's no national debate. Uh, they, sh they should be happening. There should be conversations taking place in every parliament, but there should be conversations taking place around the dinner tables uh, of every household. I mean, like this is this is about the way our world will be in the future. It's about the way mm. our children's world will be in the future. And I think it's that gives us a responsibility to at least show an interest in what is happening right now and how that could affect us in the future and to listen to other voices and to listen to other opinions like you said before like the idea of just calling people who we think follow the dictates of government too eagerly just calling them sheeple i think is you know that sort of simplification is not helpful mm -hmm. It's about yeah. trying to understand each other and trying to inform each other. You can only inform other people if you can, if you are willing to listen to them first. Deeply. Listen deeply. Yeah. Thank you, my brother. I appreciate this conversation. Uh, your book, Scanned, is out and available everywhere now. I know I got an advanced copy, but I'm assuming that uh, by the time this podcast releases, it'll be out and available everywhere. It is, it is already out and available. It's uh, available at Amazon. It's available at the publishers, chelseagreen.com, and lots and lots of different independent bookstores. Yeah, beautiful. Uh, Chelsea Green publishing, Matthias Desmet, Charles Eisenstein, uh, a lot of, lot of great authors uh, through that publishing house. So thanks to them as well. All right, my friend. Well, thanks for having me, Aubrey. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely. Yeah, been a real pleasure. Have a beautiful day. Or it's, I guess it's night for you. Enjoy it your evening. It is night. I'm going to have a beer. <laughs> all right. Go for it. Yeah. I think we all need a beer after this conversation. <laughs> Where's my beer? Maybe something Where's stronger. <laughs> Maybe something stronger. Indeed. Take all care. All right. Take care, Aubrey. In case you guys haven't heard, we're launching a premium podcast, which is going to include a monthly AMA episode only for the premium podcast on Supercast. Also, all kinds of unreleased guided meditations, guided breath works, guided ecstatic dances, whatever we can put on there that we can support you and thank you for supporting us on our podcast, our ability to have the best tech, the best studio, the best guests that we can fly out and really try to bring this to the ultimate level of what it's capable. So first of all, just want to say thank you for listening in the first place. And if you want to go to that next level, get more from me and contribute to the podcast in a more significant way, check it out, aubreymarcuspodcast.supercast.com. Once again, aubreymarcuspodcast.supercast.com. And the bonus is you'll never hear me read another ad about anything else ever again. 
Thanks for tuning into this podcast with Nick Corbishley. Once again, his book is called Scanned. I would love to hear from you, hear what you're feeling, hear what you're thinking. Reach out on social media at Aubrey Marcus or in the comments. I love you guys and I'll see you next week.